Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to A Word from the Lord. This is James over here with you, and this is December the 31st, 2017, the last day of the year. And what better way to wind down the the year than to be studying God's Word and hope that you have your, your Bible and your pens and paper ready to uh, study God's Word with us today. A Word from the Lord is is a live call-in program, and we're going to give you the phone numbers uh, right now so that you can know how to be a part of the program if you would like to be. Phone number is area code 336-427-9696. That's 427-9696 or 627-9563. 627-9563 is how you can be a part of a word from the Lord. And uh, this evening, what we're going to be discussing is something that it might help you as you are planning to come into the new year. This is usually a time when people start um, making New Year's resolutions and they're going to change things and do better and and um, change you know things in their life that they don't like. And so this is going to be a lesson that I hope will help you consider a very important aspect of your life and how you, what you can do to change it and to make yourself a better person, not only uh, uh, physically, but also in a relationship with God. And so we're going to be talking about conversion, being changed, and what does it mean to be converted? You know, uh, when it comes to being conversions, a lot of times people just say, well, I'm going to come to Jesus just the way I am, you know, uh, or they tell people, come to Jesus just as you are. But the thing about it is, you can't just come to Jesus and say, that's it. Uh, the Bible doesn't really say, come to Jesus. The Bible says, obey the gospel. Jesus himself said this in Matthew 18, verse 3. He said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. And so the important thing that we need to be discussing or thinking about is, how is it that you can be converted? What does it mean to be converted? Is there, <clears throat> is there something special you have to do, or is it just something that you little say a little prayer or whatever? You get a little track and um, people tell you, well, just say this little prayer or just make these changes and, and boom, you're, you're converted. But what does the Bible have to say about being converted? Is there, is there something that has to change in order to enter the kingdom of heaven? I mean, what does it mean to become converted? Except you be converted is what Jesus said. So uh, conversion is something you really should be considering, something you should be thinking about as you enter into this... Uh, uh, winding down this year, and as you start <clears throat> the year 2018, so I hope that you will uh, stay tuned and join us in our study together as we talk about being converted. Let me give you some more content information, if you will. Just take a little break here to, to uh, remind you of this. A Word from the Lord is brought to you by the Church of Christ. We meet at 250 The Boulevard in Eden, North Carolina. And uh, we meet Sundays at 9 a.m. and 10 a.m. for Bible study and worship, and Thursdays at 7 p.m. for Bible study as well. And we really hope that you will join us and be part of part of our Bible studies and, and assemblies. We like to study the Bible. We want you to ask questions. We we uh, encourage people to ask questions and uh, take notes and question what, what's being said. Don't take what we're saying at face value. And a lot of times when you... Uh, are in so-called Bible studies. I've been to places where they say, well, we take Bible questions as long as we're in agreement. Well, what is there to question then? If everybody's in agreement <clears throat> on the same thing, or if everybody's understanding the uh, the same thing, or, uh, then what it really is there to question? So we want you to come and, and ask questions. You know, we're going to be cordial and and um, um, take your, uh, your questions seriously, and we'll give you a Bible answer for what you're what you're asking, but we want you to come be part of the, our assemblies with us and, and study the Bible with us. We hope that you will do that very thing. 250 The Boulevard is where we meet, and it's the Church of Christ. If you would like to reach me uh, after this program is over with, you can reach me at 276-340-2653. 276 340 or you can email me at a word from the Lord at gmail.com. A word from the Lord at gmail.com. And <clears throat> we'll be glad to uh, discuss the Bible with you that way, or come to your house, have a Bible, Bible, uh, home Bible study, or anything that we can do, any literature. If you have a question about something, there's a certain topic, <clears throat> excuse me, that you're 
wanting more information about, uh, chances are we have a lesson, maybe a DVD or CD, something that we can give, put into your hands, a book, uh, some kind of information that will help you. And then, of course, it'll all be free of charge. We never, we never ask you for a dime. We never ask people from the community to contribute or to donate money to help uh, fund um, these programs. This is this is something that the Lord's people do. We give freely. We have a free will offering that we, as members of the Lord's Church, lay by in store on the first day of the week, uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, and that's how we carry on the function of the, of the work of the Lord. We never ask for money from those outside of the body of Christ. Sometimes people say, well, how, how do you function if you don't take up money? Well, we don't take up money from you. <laughs> We're asking where well, our, our brethren give and so that we don't have to ask money from the outside. We don't have to have telethons or begathons, as I like to call them, because um, that's just, you know, we're doing the things the way the Bible says, and that's how we're taking care of our of our needs. So we hope that you'll come visit with us and, and participate with us and, and let us help you in any way we can as we're looking forward to studying God's Word. So as we're winding down uh, one year and starting into another, there may be some changes that you need to make. Maybe some changes that you're thinking about making. But as we said in Matthew 18 and verse 3, Jesus said, Except ye be converted, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. So what does it mean to be converted? And then how how how, are you, how does a person uh, then be converted? Uh, well, first of all, we need to understand where conversion takes place. Conversion has to take place in your heart. It has to take place with the inner man. In Matthew 13 and verse 15, Matthew 13 and verse 15, I want you to listen to what, what Jesus said. Now, as Jesus is, is talking to individuals about their, uh, about their lives, and he talks, he's in Matthew 13, he's actually giving a parable of the sower that went forth to sow and the seed of, of the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, fell upon different kinds of hearts. And this is what he said. He said, um, Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. So the thing about conversion is you have to understand that it is something that takes place with the inner man. You know, people make changes on the outside all the time. They do things to to change their looks, you might say, but that is not a conversion. You know, that that may be a, a, a cover-up or a type of conversion, maybe converting the outside, but that doesn't mean that it's really changed on the inside. And so this is what we're talking about. A conversion is a deliberate change made by a person. Someone says, you know what, I'm going to make a change. It has to start on the inside because a man, you and I are, we, you know, we're people from the inside out. And you can, you know, you can make some superficial changes on the outside and that doesn't mean that you're really a changed person. Uh, you know, it's kind of like plastic surgery, I guess. And that's really what man-made uh, doctrines do. Man-made doctrines are really just plastic surgery. They, they give you a, a facade, an outward appearance of changes, but inside, if you haven't changed, you're still the same person. And uh, here's a good example. In Acts chapter 17, Acts chapter 17, I want you to notice what, uh, what is, is going on here. In Acts 17, verses 1 through 4, and when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. Now this is Paul and his traveling group. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbaths today reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. Okay? And some of them believed and consorted with Paul, and Silas, and of the devout Greeks, a great multitude, and of the chief women, not a few. So as Paul comes in, he's reasoning with them. He's opening and alleging. He's, he's debating, really, is what he's doing. And there are some individuals that are making some changes. Now notice, 
Skip down to verse 11. And these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Therefore many of them believed, also of honorable women, which were Greeks, and of men, not a few. Uh, so the, the idea of conversion takes place when people determine when people determine that they are going to change their lives. <clears throat> so friends, <clears throat> excuse me, it, what we're talking about is conversion. We're talking about turning. We're talking about turning, tur turning over a new leaf or becoming a, a different person. In, a, in Acts, thir Acts 3, excuse me, Acts 3, Acts 3 and verse uh, 19, listen to what uh, the Bible says. In Acts 3 and verse 19, uh, I'm getting my, my Bible up here, giving me a little trouble here. Acts 3, 19. <clears throat> now this is Peter. He says, Repent ye therefore and be converted. Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. So the word is to turn. It's to, it's to uh, repent and be converted or to turn. Uh, here's a way in which it's used in Acts 11 verse 21. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. So there's the idea. We're turning to the Lord. So when someone says, well, I've been converted. Well, friends, if you have been converted, then you're actually turning to the Lord. It's not just turning away from something. It's not just turning your back on something and doing something else. It's an idea that I'm turning because I need to turn to God. Now, Think about it this way. There's a lot of individuals that maybe turn because of some reason. Maybe the doctor gave them a reason. I use this illustration a lot. Someone goes to the doctor and the doctor says, you know, if you don't quit drinking, uh, you're going to have cirrhosis of the liver and you're going to die. Or if you don't quit smoking, you know, you're going you're gonna to die. You need to, you need to stop this. So, so the people, they, they make lifestyle changes. They've, they've converted to a different way of life in the sense because, you know, they want to live longer. Now, in a sense, that is conversion, but that's not conversion based upon what they heard from God. They didn't, they didn't change because what they were doing was sinning against God. They converted because the doctor said, you're going to die. And so a conversion, a conversion turns people away from <clears throat> excuse me, a sinful life but turns them to God. Notice this in Acts 26 and verse 18. Acts 26 and verse 18. And again, I hope you're writing these down. Paul said his job, this was, this was his job. He's, he's telling about his conversion and he's telling what uh, Christ wanted him to do. And he said, here's my job. His job was to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. So they turn from darkness to light. They turn from Satan unto God. And so it's a change not just, uh, like I said, not just outside, but it's the idea of I'm sinning against God. Let me give you another uh, uh, way to think about this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, and verse 10, now this is where Paul is talking about <clears throat> repentance, and we're, this is along the same lines. But notice what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. He says, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Now notice the difference in the sorrow that works salvation and the sorrow that works death. Godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. And the sorrow of the world is what leads to death. Because one sorrow, the sorrow of the world, is you're just sorry maybe because you did it or maybe because you got caught or maybe you just regret it. But it's not, it's not enough to make you say, you know what, I've been sinning against God and therefore I'm going to change. And that's the difference between godly sorrow that works repentance, I'm sorry because I sinned against God. That's what leads to salvation as opposed to, well, I'm sorry I got caught. I'm not going to do it anymore. Uh, or I'm sorry I got caught, and so therefore 
I'm not going to do it until maybe I can get away with it again. So different kinds of sorrow, different kinds of conversion is what we're talking about here. So the, we're still getting back to the question then, if, if conversion is changing, how is one converted? How is one uh, changed, you might say? Well, consider this. In John 16 and verse 7, now, Jesus is talking about leaving. He's, he's preparing his disciples for the time when he won't be with them. And he makes an interesting statement that I think a lot of people then, when they read this, they then start formulating, they start having their own idea about what this means. In John 16 and verse 7, this is what Jesus says. Jesus said, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. So he's talking about the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. And notice what he says. Notice what the Holy Spirit is, is going to do. When he has come, this is verse 8, John 16, 8. When he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Now, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. <clears throat> now, this word reprove, this word reprove, it means to confute or admonish, and it's translated convict. He's going to convict the world of sin. It's translated in another place to convince, so he's going to convince the world of their sin. It's in another place, it's translated tell a fault. So the Holy Spirit is going to tell the fault of the world. He's going to tell the world their faults. He's going to tell them where they're wrong. He's going to rebuke them, convict them, uh, reprove them. Now, here's the question then. Because I hear people say all the time, well, he, I was under conviction. You might have heard people say that. Oh, he was under conviction. He was under conviction. Well, what does that mean? You see, you don't get to determine then what it means to be under conviction. If you are convicted of sin by the Holy Spirit, then we have to let the Bible then tell us what does that mean to be convicted by the Holy Spirit. Because if we're convicted of sins, uh, then that's going to determine whether we're going to be converted. If a person is convicted of sins and determines uh, that they are converted by the Holy Spirit, then we have to find out, well, what then is involved in this conversion process? You see, if the Holy Spirit convicts of sin, how does he do it? Now, we know that you have to be convicted or you'll never be converted. All right, there has to be some reproof there. There has to be some ad, ad, admonition there, some admonishing, convincing that you're wrong. That's the, that's the conviction part in order to be converted because conviction has to come before conversion. There's no conversion. There's no changing unless you are convinced or convicted of, of sin. So how does that take place? How does that take place? How does the Spirit convict of sin in order to get someone to be converted. Now, you may have some ideas about this, but we're going to we're going to get into the Bible and let's see what the scripture has to say about being convicted of sin. But I want to stop right here. That's that's we're thinking about this. Let me stop right here and give the phone numbers out again. It may be that you're you have some questions about something we've said already and you want to be a part of the program. Here's how you can do that. The phone number is area code 336. 427 9696. 427 9696. That's 427 WMYN. Or 627 9563. 627 WLOE. 627 WLOE. If you want to be part of the program. And the phone lines are open. So uh, go ahead and call. Now, <clears throat> so how is it that a person is convicted of sin? How does, how does the Holy Spirit uh, convict of sin? Well, let's, let's notice some things first. Let's stay in John chapter six, 16, John chapter 16 and, verse, and uh, look at verses 7 and 8 again. Jesus said the Spirit was promised. He promised his disciples the Spirit. Uh, it's expedient for him to go away so that the Comforter will come. If the Comfort, uh, 
the comforter won't come as long as Jesus is, is there with him. He said, but if I depart, I'll send him unto you. And then he said, so, so the spirit was promised. And then he said the spirit was going to convict the world of sin or, or reprove the world of sin. So the question we're having is, how does the Spirit do this? Or how did the Spirit do that? Well, let's come, let's keep, continue reading. Let's continue reading. And when we get to um, <clears throat> John 16 and verse 13, this is what Jesus says. <clears throat> how be it? How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Now, the Spirit is going to give some words. The Spirit is going to give some words, some truth that he's guided the apostles in, and that's how he is going to then convict the world. Conviction has to come through the word. Now, remember, just because someone's convicted of sin, that is, they're approved of sin, or they're convinced that, that they are sin, that does not mean that they're converted. I mean, people can be convicted that they've done wrong and not change one bit, all right? But this is how the Spirit is going to convict. He's going to convict through words. Let me, give you, let me give you some examples here, just a couple of examples. In Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 37, you have Peter and the other apostles on the day of Pentecost, and they're standing up preaching, and Peter says to them, uh, Peter and the other uh, 12, other 11, excuse me, they, they say to these uh, Jews on the day of Pentecost, they said that whosoever shall call upon the Lord shall be saved. They start talking to them about the uh, Christ and the being crucified. And uh, this is a fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel and so forth. And in verse 21, he says, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And he addresses, Ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye you yourselves know. Uh, him being delivered by the determinate, determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands crucified and slain. And God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it would not, it was not possible that he should be holding of it. So he's convicted them. He says, you killed the Christ, you crucified him, uh, you, you, you slew him, uh, but God raised him up from the dead. Now as he goes on, as he goes on, we most are pretty familiar with Acts chapter 2, when he gets to verse 36, he says, let therefore, let therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. Well, what had happened to them? They were convicted. They were convicted. How were they convicted? They were convicted by the words that were being spoken. Whose words were they? Well, Peter and the rest of the apostles were, were speaking but ultimately, it was words that they were being guided to give by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was guiding them to say these words, which in turn was convicting these people, this, this large group of people on the day of Pentecost, and that's how they came to say, men and brethren, what shall we do? So they were convicted by these words. <clears throat> uh, we, could, you know, we could go through a number of these conversion accounts, and if we have time, we'll go through some of them. So more of them. But the one thing you're always going to find out, friends, is the Holy Spirit convicts through words. And that, in turn, is what can, gets people to convert. That's what gets them to change. Now, as we said, just, be, just because they were convicted, that doesn't mean they were converted. But when they heard the words, and it pricked them in their heart, and they were convinced we've killed the Christ, then they were converted. So the method of conviction and conversion is through the preaching of the word. In Romans 1 verse 16, that's why Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone that believeth, 
to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The power of God to save is the gospel, the preaching of the gospel. And so in order to be converted, number one, you have to be convicted by the word. Now, let me just stop and, and, and make this point, friends. You might feel guilty about something. You might be made to feel, uh, I'll just use the denominational term, under conviction, right? You may be under conviction for something, but you didn't get, you didn't become under conviction based upon hearing the word of God. Listen, I've heard, I've heard tons of preachers. You turn them on TV and hear them all the time. And what you hear is, you hear people uh, using sob stories or you hear them uh, uh, hyping up the emotions and people, oh, you know, they respond. And they'll do all kinds of things because they've been hopped up on the emotion, you know. Send your dollar, send your thousand dollars, plant your seed. Uh, if you love Jesus, you'll, you'll, you'll pass this on to your friends, whatever it may be. And people will, are convicted based upon what they hear, but it's not from the Bible. So friends, number one, conversion has to start by being convicted by the word. Now, if what you're hearing is not in the Bible, friends, and you're saying, well, I, I, I gave my soul to Jesus, well, what did you hear, first of all? Because if you heard something that's not in the Bible, did you really give your soul to Jesus? <laughs> See that? If you, if you heard something that's not in the Bible, did you, really, did you really convert to Jesus? Did you really convert to the Lord's side? Because the only way you can convert to the Lord is if, you're, if you hear words from the Lord. See how they go hand in hand? So you can't be, let's just say it this way, you can't be convicted wrong and converted right. If the word of God is not what con con convicts you, then you're not going to be converted according to, to the scripture. So here, here's what's necessary. Here's what's necessary in order to be converted and, or convicted and converted. There are some things that must take place in order for there to be a conversion as the Bible talks about. And without them, there is no conversion. Number one, you have to have a change of heart. We kind of talked about that a little bit. If, if your heart is not changed, then you haven't really been convicted or converted. All right? Now listen. In Acts chapter, 15, Acts chapter 15, Acts chapter 15, and verse 9. Now, in the context here, you have a large group of, of Christians that have come together in Jerusalem, and they're discussing whether uh, Gentiles have to obey the law of Moses, be circumcised in order to become Christians. And this is what Peter says. Peter said, uh, this is Acts 15, verse 7. He said, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles, by my mouth, should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, here's, here's the point I'm, I'm wanting you to get. You have to have a change of heart. All right? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. And again, if, if your heart's not changed based upon what you heard the Bible say, then you didn't really change. Now, a change of heart from what you hear the Bible saying is going to result in a change of life. It's going to change your life. In Matthew 12 and verse 41, Matthew 12 and verse 41, now Jesus is, going, Jesus is speaking here, and listen to what he says. He says, the men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Now, if you go back and you read the book of Jonah, Jonah chapter uh, 3 and verse 10, you'll, you'll recall that as uh, Jonah goes into Nineveh and he's preaching, he knows what's going to happen. He knows that when people hear the word of the Lord, they're going to repent. And that's exactly what happened in John and Jonah 3 
uh, in verse 10, and God saw their works that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said he would do unto them, and he did it not. And listen to what Jonah says in chapter 4 and verse 1. And it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of evil. Therefore, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Now, Jonah was angry because he knew the minute I start preaching to these Ninevites, the minute I go up here to Assyria and I start preaching in Nineveh, they're going to repent and God's going to forgive them. You see what he knew about the Word of God? He knew the Word of God was going to convict. And he knew that when these folks were genuinely convicted, they were going to convert. And that's exactly what they did. They, they repented of their, uh, of their works. They, re they, they, tur they turned away from their, their, their evil deeds. And so it results in a change of life. That, that godly sorrow that we uh, talked about earlier in 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 10. And so when you are genuinely convicted based upon the word of God, then you, you, turn, you turn from evil. In Romans 2 and verse 4, Paul says this way. He says, Despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? See, friends, when you, when you are convicted or convinced that you're sinning and that you're sinning against God, then a genuine change of heart is going to result in a change of life. Now, again, you have to be, you have to be converted by, by hearing the word. This is why, friends, sometimes people say, well, you know, James, sometimes y'all are too hard. Y'all telling people uh, <clears throat> about what they're doing, you tell them they're wrong. Well, the reason why you, you come out and tell people they're wrong based upon the Bible is because you want them to genuinely be convicted that what they're saying or doing or how they're living or how they're worshiping is wrong according to the scripture. The word is what's going to convict them. Now, their heart is what's going to determine if they truly convert. See? If they hear the word of God, if you hear someone preaching from the word of God and you recognize that what you're saying or doing is wrong and it doesn't it doesn't get you to change, that doesn't motivate you to change, then friends, you're not truly converted because conversion, conversion takes one, a change of heart. Two, it takes a change of life based upon on what you've heard. And then that, in turn, brings about a change of state, change of where you are. Now what do you mean by that, James? Here's what I mean by this. In Colossians 1 and verse 13, this is what Paul says. Colossians 1 and verse 13. He said, Who hath delivered us from th giving thanks to, to the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Now, this is what I know about conviction and conversion. If a person hears the gospel and they realize, you know what, what I'm doing is not in accordance with the scripture. And so they try to, they start making changes. If they're sincere in those changes, you know where they'll wind up? They'll wind up leaving any man-made traditions that they're following, any man-made church that they're in, and they'll wind up in the kingdom of God. Now, friends, there are plenty of people out there, and some of you are listening. I know you You listen to the program, you watch the TV programs, you listen to this program, and you're saying, you know what, what y'all saying is right. But you're still in the Methodist Church. You're still in the Baptist Church. You're still in the Lutheran Church. You're still in the Presbyterian Church. You, it hadn't moved you. You say, oh, I know it's right. Well, okay. You know what's right. If what we're saying is right, and what we're saying is that the church you're in is wrong. 
Are you really convinced about it? If you if if you're really convinced that the church you're in is wrong, then why haven't you changed where you are? If you're truly convicted that the way you've been worshiping is wrong, why haven't you changed? Why haven't you genuinely been converted then? Let me give an example of how of how this works. When the Apostle Paul, when the Apostle Paul was uh, told, when he was convinced, we'll say, that he was wrong, notice what happened to him in Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, he's going to Damascus, and we're going to start reading in verse 3. And suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth, and heard a voice from a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he fell to the earth and heard a voice, uh, and, excuse me, and he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and went. And when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there, and he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. Now, was, was Saul of Tarsus, was he convicted? Yeah, he was convicted. He was definitely he was definitely convinced that what he was doing was wrong. He said, I thought better within myself that I ought to do things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. But now, on this occasion, when he finally meets Jesus, he says, All right, what should what should I do? See now he's convicted. He's definitely he's definitely having a change of heart here because he's saying, Okay, I'm gonna stop doing what I've been doing and I'm gonna I need some information on what I'm what I need to do to change. And so Ananias comes to him and of course there's there's how he's converted. He's told what he must do. And so there that's the that's the change. But look what here's my point. What did Paul do once he talked to Ananias? Once he talked to Ananias, do you remember what he did? Let's notice in Galatians one and verse uh, 16, Paul says <clears throat> that when God uh, called him to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen, notice what he says here, Galatians 1.16. He says, Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again into Damascus. When Saul of Tarsus was convicted that he was doing wrong, that what he thought was right, the way he was worshiping, when, when he was told, you know, the way you're worshiping is wrong, Saul, you, you actually are killing Christians. You're actually persecuting Christ. And when he was convicted of that, he said, okay, what I need to do. And when he was told what he needed to do, uh, I suggest you go back and, and read Acts 9 and verse um, uh, uh, 19. Acts 9, 19. When Saul of Tarsus had received meat, he was strengthened. And when Saul, and then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Immediately he started preaching what he once persecuted. That's what he says in Galatians 1, 22 and 23. He said, I started preaching what I once persecuted. Now, did he change? He, he changed, friends. He was convicted, and that led him to his conversion. It moved him, see? He started doing something differently. But when I talk to people, or when people tell me, well, I, I was converted, I was convicted, Okay, how were you convicted? Well, I, I heard I heard the preaching, and I went down to the mourner's bench, and I did this. Well, 
you weren't convicted by the word because the word would never say go down to the mourner's bench. He said, well, I was convicted because I went down to the altar. You, you weren't convicted by the Bible because the Bible doesn't say go to, uh, go to the altar call. You, you see what I'm saying? You might have been convicted by something, but you weren't convicted by the word. And if you weren't convicted by the word, then whatever you were converted to was not the truth. It may have changed your life in some way, but it didn't take you from the power of darkness into the kingdom of the dear of God's dear Son. You might have been you might have been converted from living heathen ways over here, drinking and smoking and gambling and running women, but it didn't convert you to the Lord's church. See that if you're in a church that's not in the Bible, so you change from something, but you didn't change to what what God says. You're still not in the kingdom. You're just a better heathen is all you really are. As one brother says, you know, denomination might keep you out of jail, but it won't keep you out of hell. So what I'm saying, friends, is the word convicts you, and then that leads you to convert to what God says. And that's why I, it just, you know, it just bumfuzzles me. When, when people say, oh, I, I like your program, I listen to you all the time, love what you're doing, yada, 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 blah, 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 and okay, that's fine, well, and good, but why are you still in these man-made churches? See? <laughs> I mean, how, how can you say you're converted and you're convicted and yet you stay where you are? That's not truly converted. Not truly converted. It makes you really wonder, are you truly convicted? See? Because conversion moves you. It, it puts you into a different place. It puts you into a different place. In Romans 6, verses 3 and 4, Romans 6, verses 3 and 4, when you hear the gospel preached, it moves you into a place where you're now, now in a relationship with God. In Romans 6, uh, verse 3, Paul says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. If we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Now friends, I know, I know that many of you haven't, haven't been, uh, haven't changed states, in other words, you haven't changed really where you are, because you don't believe the baptism is what puts you into Christ. So you, you don't believe what the Word says about changing. You don't believe what the Word has to say about baptism's role in a conversion. If you were convicted by the Word, when Jesus said, He that believeth in his baptized shall be saved, you would do that in a heartbeat. And then you would be a member of the Lord's church. You wouldn't wind up in a, in a man-made church. See? Because when you are convicted by the word and you're obedient to the word, guess where you wind up? You wind up in the body of Christ. In Galatians 3, Galatians 3, verse 27, Paul said, As many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And if you've been baptized into Christ, that means you've been baptized into his church. Because Christ's body is the church. The church is the body and the body is the church. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. No two ways around about it. If you say, I've been baptized into Christ, then you have to say you've been, we were baptized into the church of Christ. Because if you're baptized into Christ, you're baptized into the church. But don't tell me you're baptized into, into Christ and you wound up in a man-made church. No. You weren't convicted of something, and you certainly weren't converted if you wound up in a man-made church. And so I'm just saying, friends, conversion, conversions move you into a place where God wants you. If you're truly converted, you wind up in a place where God says the saved are going to be. In Acts 2, verse 47, the saved were added to the church. The Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So, 
Someone says, well, I, I used to I used to be a wild, a wild fella. Okay, well, maybe you were. But that doesn't mean you're you're in the Lord's church now. That doesn't mean you've been converted. If you're not worshiping God the way he says, you're not living in all aspects of, of your life the way God says, then are you truly converted? I mean, I know, I mean, I know there's people that have, have changed in their lives. But we're talking about being convicted because God said it. And I just, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm still trying to figure out how it is that people can say, well, I, I love God, I do what God says. And when you read the Bible and it says, this is what you must do, then, well, I'm just not going to do that. Well, you, you must not really be convicted by the word because you haven't truly been converted. So how do you know when you're converted? Call me, call me and tell me how you knew you're converted. See? Let, let me know. How, let's, let's talk about this. How, how are you converted? we got about 15 minutes left. 336-427-9696. How do you know when you're converted? Now, some people quote-unquote know, I'm using air quotes here, they, they know they are converted because they had this feeling or they had this, you know, experience. Friends, is that is that really how you know? I mean, are we really going to go by feelings? You know that you're in service to God. You know that you're doing what God says because you have a feeling about it? I, I want you to consider this. In, in John 16... Let's go back to John 16. And let's just talk about feelings for a minute because you can feel like you're in the service to God and that doesn't mean that you that you are. In John 16 verse 1, these things have I spoken unto you that you should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogue. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God service. Now, Let's stop there for a moment. If we're going to go by feelings, what people think as the, as the factor that says, you, well, you're doing what God says because you just think you're doing it. Well, are you going to say that about murder? Is murdering someone how you know that you're pleasing God? I mean, I mean look at Saul of Tarsus. That's what Saul of Tarsus did. Saul of Tarsus here he is. He said, you know what? I, I, I thought I lived in a good conscience uh, before God until this day. He said, I, I just, you know, I had no problem killing these people. In Acts 24 and verse 16, he says, and herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward all men. I, I, he thought that what he was doing was the will of God. Uh, did that make it right? So you th you think, well, I go to church every Sunday. I'm, I'm active in my church, is what people say. See, I'm active in my church. I, 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 I help at my church. We have vacation Bible school in my church. I'm part of the Ladies Auxiliary ch Club at my church. We take, we take uh, food over to the, the sick people in my church. See that? Oh, well, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a preacher in my church. Well, how did you get into your church? Where were you convicted about that? See that? Just because you think this, friends, doesn't mean that you've been convicted by the word of God, and therefore there's no way you can say you're truly converted to God. You can't say you're truly converted to God if, if you're just going on feelings. See that? So, so how is it? How is it that you're going to say, "Well, this is I know I'm converted." The, the Bible nowhere talks about feelings as being the the model, the 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 pattern that we're using to determine if if what we're doing is right. Now, I know I've I've um, uh, read you these before, I'm pretty sure. But John John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, he says this is how he knows about his conversion. He said. Uh, a happy and thorough conversion marked his religious experience. He says, I felt my heart strangely warmed. 
I felt I did trust in Christ alone for salvation, as assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. He knew he was saved because he felt it. I feel it. Oh, I feel it. I, I must be saved. I had a strangely warm feeling and I did trust in Christ alone for my salvation. And I had assurance that my sins were taken away. Now friends, is that convicted by the word of God? Because you don't find that in the word of God. Nowhere would you ever find in the word of God get a warm feeling for assurance that what, you're, that what you've done has converted you. And in the book of Mormon, the book of Mormon in Moroni chapter 10 verse 4, Here's what the Mormons say. When ye shall, this is Moroni 10 verse 4 from the Book of Mormon. And when ye shall receive these things, I would exhort you that ye would ask God, the Eternal Father, in the name of Christ, if these things are not true. And if ye shall ask with a sincere heart, with real intent, having faith in Christ, he will manifest the truth of it unto you by the power of the Holy Ghost. All right, so you've got to ask with a sincere heart and in real intent. All right, now that, that sounds pretty much like what John Wesley did, but let's read again. In Doctrines and Covenants, chapter 9 and verse 8, again, this is the Mormons, Latter-day Saints. Doctrines and Covenants, nine and, chapter 9 and verse 8, but I behold, I say unto you, that you must study it out in your mind, and then you must ask me if it be right. And if it is right, I will cause that your bosom shall burn within you, therefore you shall feel that it is right. Friends, that's not conviction based upon the word of God. That may be conviction based upon John Smith, Joseph Smith, I mean. That may be conviction based upon what a man says, We'll give you some assurance, but that is not assurance in the, from the Bible. How can you say you're convicted? How can you say you've been converted if your conviction, if your conviction is from something that's not even in the Bible? See? Friends, your feelings are not the pattern for a conversion. You don't get converted. You don't get, you, you're not converted because you were convicted of some feeling. And you feel that it's right. And you certainly aren't going to be converted if you act upon those feelings and then say, well, I feel that I'm converted. Well, friends, you, I, you can feel one, one way all you want to, and that doesn't mean it's right. See? Listen, in Jeremiah 17 and verse 9, in Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9, Here's what Jeremiah said. He said, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Proverbs 14 and verse 12. Proverbs 14, 12. There is a way which seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. You, you may think it's right. You may think it's right, but that doesn't mean that you have been converted, translated into the kingdom of God. Because you haven't been convicted by the Spirit through His Word, with His Word. See, everywhere in, everywhere in the Bible that you read about someone being converted, someone being convicted, and then converted, it all is the, it's the same pattern. It's the same pattern. In the New Testament, it's the same pattern. Always, they hear the Word and they obey it. Not they heard someone else's word, but they heard what came from the Bible. And friends, that's what we're saying to you. If, if, if you believe something with all your heart, show it in the Bible. If you're convinced that what, you're, what you believe is right, if you're convinced that what you, what you have obeyed is, is the truth, just show it in the Bible. $1,000 reward. $1,000 reward for someone who can show the Baptist church in the Bible. Can't be done. Methodist Church, not in the Bible. Lutheran Church, not in the Bible. The practice, the practices of the Lord's Church 
are, are clearly set forth in the Bible. In other words, the pattern of the Lord's church, what it looks like, what it acts like, how it operates. It's in the Bible. And if you say, well, I'm part of, I'm part of a church that's in the Bible, you say, I'm in the church of God. Okay, well, so you're in the church of God. Let's see if the church of God that you're in matches up with the church of God in the Bible. Is the church of God described in the Bible, does it look like the church of God that you're going to describe? I guarantee it's not. The church of God in the Bible doesn't have women preachers, but the church of God headquarters in Cleveland, Tennessee does. The church of God in the Bible does not have a headquarter in, in Tennessee, but the church of God uh, denomination headquartered in Cleveland, Tennessee the Church of God in the Bible doesn't have one pastor ruling the whole church, but the Church of God, man's Church of God does. See, see how different it is? Mechanical instruments and music? Not in the Church of God in the Bible, but the Church of God you read about uh, in the Yellow Pages, you know, over there in Cleveland, Tennessee, oh, they'll have it. Now, why are you convinced that that's the right church? You weren't convinced by the Bible. Can't be convinced by the Bible. So how do you know you're converted? You know you're converted when you've done what God said do. And that's what we're always stressing. Just Let's just go back to the Bible. Let's find out what God said do. And if you can show that you did what God said do, then you can say with greater certainty that, you know, I, I'm, I'm converted. I'm, I'm a child of God. In 1 John chapter 2, in verse 3, here's what John says. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. Do you keep God's word? You say, well, I keep God's word. Well, if you're keeping God's word, won't you show me what you do in the Bible? See how easy that is? How simple that is? So, so how, how are you converted then? Well, in Acts 16 to verse 30, 31, Acts 16 verse 31, I'm going to try to wrap up here. The Philippian jailer was told, he said, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and all that were in his house. And it took him the same hour of the night and washed their stripes, and was baptized in all his straight way. What did they do? He believed, based upon hearing the word of God. That convicted him to do something, to repent. He washed their stripes. Paul said, all men must repent. It's the command of God, Acts 17, verse 30. And then be baptized. Everybody in the New Testament, friends, who were convicted of the truth, after they heard the word of God, were convicted and converted by believing that Jesus is the Son of God, repenting of their sins, and confessing that Jesus was the Son of God, confessing their faith in Christ, Acts 8, 36-37, and then being baptized for the remission of sins. Every one of them in the New Testament, all were baptized for the remission of their sins. You can read all the conversion accounts. Some of them will just give us a, a piece of, of what they did, Maybe they heard, maybe they believed, maybe they repented, but they all are said to have been baptized. Why? Because baptism is where God operates and takes away their sins. Colossians 2, verses 11 and 12. God operates and removes our sins when we, after being convicted of, of the Word of God, convinced that we need to repent and turn to Him and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins that God adds us to the church. Friends, that's how you that's how you converted. Let us know if you are if you are convinced that where you are is wrong. Let us help you in any way we can. My name is James Oldfield. This is a word from the Lord brought to you by the Church of Christ. It meets at 250 the Boulevard. Reach me at 276-340-2653. Till next time, see you next year. Always make sure you're getting it.